Okay, we'll bring the meeting to order and start out with roll call. Representative Cornish? Here. Representative Johnson? Representative Considine? Representative Dean? Representative Hurtos? Here. Representative Hillstrom? Here. Representative Howe? Here. Representative Lomer? Representative Lucero? Here. Representative Newberger? Ready to serve. Representative O'Neill? Here. Representative Quam? Present. Representative Rosenthal? Here. Representative Schoen? Representative Ward? Here. Representative Winkler? And Representative Zerwas? Okay, we've got a quorum, and uh, <coughs> first action will be to approve the minutes of February 11th. Somebody want to move the minutes? Move. Representative O'Neill moves the minutes for February 11th. Without any corrections, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carried. We'll move into our first order of business, House File 329 from Representative Detmer, state employees assaulted by inmates or patients provided continued insurance contributions. And this Representative Detmer, I'll move your bill be recommended to pass and move on to Health and Human Services Finance, if you don't mind. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, committee members. I also have an, the A15 amendment. If, I'd like to get the A15 amendment uh, in order so that the bill is the way I would like to have it presented. Okay, author has the A15 amendment. I'll move the A15 amendment to get it in the order the author would like without any objection. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, a motion carried, amendments adopted. Uh, Representative Detmer, you wanna go ahead with your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, committee members. Uh, House file 329, uh, last session, if you recall, if you are here last session, uh, we uh, voted and uh, passed a bill uh, similar to this one. It was a bill that passed the Senate unanimously and it provided employer paid benefits uh, of employees of correctional facilities that were assaulted by offenders and rendered totally and permanently disabled. Uh, as defined by Minnesota statute. Uh, that bill was prompted by an investigation, investigator of the Minnesota Correction Facility in Stillwater who suffered traumatic brain injury at the hands of, of a known gang leader and an in inmate. The investigator was totally and permanently disabled and will suffer after effects the rest of his life. And uh, he is a, a constituent of mine. However, that bill was restrictive. Uh, it did not include employees of correctional retirement plan and or employers of Minnesota Security Hospitals as it was narrowed only to meet the request of the former former person, former legislator that carried the bill. I was a co-author of the bill. And uh, this legislation, that uh, House File 329, uh, requires the Minnesota Department of Corrections and the Minnesota Department of Human Services to pay the employer's share of the insurance premiums uh, for an employer who is totally, t becomes totally and permanently disabled as a result of the offender or patient assault. Uh, only employees of the security hospitals and correctional facilities are eligible. Uh, and uh, uh, these are payments would begin when the employer is determined to be totally permanently disabled under the workman's compensation law and uh, continue until the employee is fully medically eligible. Uh, by the time the employees become certified to be totally and permanently disabled, their workers, compensation, vacation, sick leave, and pay has been exhausted. Uh, their situations would make it nearly impossible to ever work again. Uh, they may be heading down the road of unintended hardships and financial ruin. In uh, the case of my constituent uh, uh, last year, he was in the process of selling off his uh, belongings, uh, him and his wife, and uh, was really, uh, didn't know where to turn, so they finally came to the legislature. There's no retroactivity in this legislation. Uh, last year, the Department of Corrections estimated that up to maybe two of their employees every 15 years uh, would meet this type of threshold. Uh, they agreed to absorb the cost at that time. Uh, the governor assigned, as a sign of support, has also said that he is, does not understand why all employees are now in this bill were not, were not covered. Uh, I'd like to turn it over. I have a uh, testifier here, Richard Kolozowski would like to uh, add some comments that I just made. Hey, sir, if you could say your name and title and then tell us also how the A15 <laughs> amendment changed the uh, main bill. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Richard Kajewski. I'm the Public Affairs and Communications Director for the Minnesota Association of Professional Employees. Um, I, Mr. Chair, members, I would say that the uh, amendment before you that was just put on the bill 
simply expands last year's bill, taking it from just general plan employees with the Minnesota Department of Corrections and now including probation agents and intensive agents out in the field who are dealing with our worst people on probation, uh, everybody uh, from people who have been sentenced with DWI offenses to people who have been released from their life sentence in prison. Um, this also includes our frontline folks who, and, and our uh, employees at the Minnesota Sex Offender Program and the State uh, Operative Forensic Services Program. And it also includes our frontline staff at our correctional facilities. That includes the guards, caseworkers, uh, and job classes who were left out. But those are the primary job classes. So that's the difference uh, in this year's bill. And that's what the amendment really specifies, that those are the areas uh, that the employees would be covered for. And I can also tell you that uh, I have found out from the department or from the Minnesota State Retirement System that there's currently 70 uh, eight people actually receiving a line of duty disability for the corrections plan, which is most of the people who've been uh, added into this bill. Uh, of those, I've been assured that very few of them uh, were the result of a offender, a client, or a patient assault. Uh, so this is really uh, only applying to people who've been assaulted to no fault of their own. This isn't the result of short staffing. This isn't the result of poor training. These are unfortunate circumstances that render employees uh, and, and put employees in a, in a real difficult position along with their family members. With that, Mr. Chair, I'll stand for any questions. Hey, thank you, sir. And the reason we're sending it to HHS finance folks is if there is a fiscal cost there, it'll be addressed in, in that jurisdiction instead of ours. And uh, I'm a, a big supporter of this bill. I have uh, <laughs> St. Peter's Security Hospital was within my, not within my district, but um, a lot of my friends and relatives work there. And there is a, a person there right now. Unfortunately, this, this isn't retroactive. And I imagine if we made it, it would change the fiscal note. So I'm not prepared to do that. But uh, a number of my uh, people have been uh, uh, seriously injured, totally disabled, uh, working <coughs> at the, uh, the hospital. It'd be nice to have from uh, assurance and security for them from uh, this day on anyway. Um, questions? We've got several of them. Representative Howe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I understand from your testimony that you mentioned probation <coughs> officers. So how about that it wouldn't count or wouldn't cover those, I, I, I assume, because it's only the Department of Corrections and Department of Human Services, that those counties that provide their own probation services with their own county employees as probation officers would not be covered by this bill? Sir. Mr. Chair and Representative Howell, that's correct. Uh, those counties would be free to you know, come forward with separate legislation that would impact a different part of statute, I would assume. Um, but this bill only re only covers state employees. And if I may add one thing, you know, the chair, Representative Cornish, um, you talked a little bit about St. Peter. I can tell you that uh, there is a recent case out of St. Peter where uh, the individual is fortunate enough to return to work, but I believe he's been out of work long enough to have received a benefit under this legislation. And I can tell you that uh, my organization does not represent this individual, but I can assure you that the people I represent at St. Peter have held a benefit uh, on his behalf because he was in jeopardy of losing his home. Um, Representative Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess what I would, I'm just concerned because those county employees do the same work. I'm just wondering, yeah, I think it would be a good idea to include those folks that if they are attacked, they should be, we should look out for those folks as well as just not specific state employees, those folks that are doing that type of work, I think we should cover them in a, a similar fashion. Thank you. Okay, Representative Hurtos. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative Detmer, for bringing this bill forward. I think it's important to uh, take care of those people that have workplace-related injuries. Um, could you just clarify uh, what you said or what I heard about workman's compensation? I know generally, uh, if the state is self-insuring, I guess I would understand that, that this bill is necessary, but otherwise would not uh, permanent disabilities be covered for a lifetime under work comp? Mr. Cold, is, is, how do you pronounce the name again? Mr. Cold. Chair, it's Kajewski. Kajewski. And, and that's okay. Um, and Representative, the workers' comp statute allows uh, individuals who qualify to collect workers' comp for a finite period of time. Uh, so that will run out under most circumstances here. 
um, the people that I've represented and, and the people that I know of that would have qualified for uh, health care uh, and the portion paid by the employer would not necessarily um, qualify for work comp other than to that point where it's cut off. So for instance, in the case of um, the constituent of Representative Detmer, uh, his work comp was already cut off. He wasn't receiving workers' compensation. His employment had ended, his work comp had ended, um, and this, you know, every single person who would qualify for benefits under this provision here is going to have a different circumstances as far as compensation goes. They're not gonna, what we're trying to prevent is to create different circumstances for what they have for health insurance. And so this bill speaks spe specifically to health insurance. Um, the workers' comp statute is very specific, but it, it's not done in perpetuity. Representative Gerkos. Uh Thank you, and thanks for that clarification. I guess I uh, was kind of missing the point a little bit. I understand that work comp is oftentimes a remuneration for wages as well as uh, for medical uh, costs related uh, in perpetuity related to that specific injury. But uh, I now more clearly understand your point is that the individual can no longer work and cannot get uh, health coverage or have an income stream for health coverage for other things that would not be related to this uh, permanent uh, disability uh, associated with, with the job. So thank you. Representative Rosenthal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative. Thank you for bringing this bill forward. Um, I had the privilege of carrying this bill for your constituent last year, and I think it's great that we're expanding it to call to include everybody that stands on the front lines and helps keep us safe. So again, thank you for bringing this forward, and you have my complete support. Yeah, M Mr. Chair, and, and again, uh, Reps. Rosenthal, I didn't see you over there uh, when I was facing the, the committee, but thank you for. Uh, you know, uh, working with my constituent, and we worked together on that, and it was really a good thing that we did. Thank you. Representative Quam. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I think in previous question we determined that it didn't cover all of the, uh, those on the front line, uh, and, and frankly, the, uh, the blue alert didn't seem to distinguish whether it was a, a state employee or a local employee, uh, and here, if you've got so many that are in the local facilities that also run the risk of assault, um, I like the bill, like to see it expanded uh, to include, a, a, as was, was mentioned, the intent of including all those on the front line. And then uh, I'm curious if uh, there's a, pooling or capability uh, to where co-workers could, who had extra uh, sick time could pull it in to extend the amount of time that, uh, uh, you know, someone gained some payback or was covered and et cetera. So I wonder if that provision is, is available to state employees and then others. Go ahead, sir. Mr. Chairman, Representative Quam, uh, let me see if I can answer at least two of the questions you specifically asked. Uh, first, in regards to the county employees, I'm a supporter. I think everybody should be covered um, who are doing this line of work, whether it's county or state employees. I would say one of the big differences is our state employee group insurance plan is recognized in statute, and I think counties vary from county to county in what they're under. So I think that that poses one major difficulty. I think it's probably better served in the collective bargaining agreements for based on one county versus the next. Um, I would also state that uh, in, in regards to your um, sick leave donation, uh, we do have a vacation donation, not a sick leave donation pool. And so there are, uh, it's an administrative procedure, it's outlined uh, specifically as to how you go about being qualified. And once you've it, uh, used up all your sick and vacation leave, you can uh, apply and be qualified to receive some of that, providing people donate to you. But um, it, it's eaten up really fast. It doesn't get you uh, real far. It does extend it a little bit, but we're not talking months. We're talking uh, more likely days or a couple of weeks. So um, it's certainly uh, something that, um, you know, continues to be a discussion in our organization as well um, and how that's used appropriately. So. Okay, it, uh, <clears throat> any more questions from members? If not, any closing comments, Representative Detmer? Well, thank you, Chair and uh, committee members. I think uh, 
the comment I made earlier was that uh, if this uh, legislation goes through and is signed into law, we won't have to be coming back on a case by case basis uh, when something, when we get a call, any of us could get a call co from a constituent that is working in these types of uh, facilities. And uh, now if we can get it uh, signed into law, uh, these, these types of situations will be taken care of. So thank you for considering. Thank you. And before I renew the motion, is there anybody in the public that wishes to comment on this uh, house well? Okay, if not, I'll renew my motion to uh, pass uh, House File 329 as amended and recommended to pass and move to the Health and Human Services Finance Committee. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, thank you very much, Representative Detmer. Thank you. And your testifier. Okay, next is the... Uh, tax court budget presentation with several people. You can either all come up at once or separate. It's up to you folks. Mr. Chair? Uh, yes, Representative Ward. While they're coming forward, I just wanted to ask, um, some of us didn't get copies of the minutes. Some of us don't have agendas. Um, we're sharing at the moment, but um, it, maybe we could watch for that in the future. Yeah, we'll make a note of that. If somebody would, yeah. Question about county rules. Uh, does that coat not require a handlebar mustache? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was surprised anybody could see me. Actually, I was going to get get by with it. I'd be a ghost in the chair with this much camouflage. But yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so noted on the uh, file there. And if anybody is missing anything, let us know. We'll make a copy. Okay. Whoever would like to start, uh, give us your name and title and begin. Chairman Cornish, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to return to the committee today. I'm Joanne Turner, the incoming Chief Judge of the Minnesota Tax Court, and with me today are the rest of the court, outgoing Chief Judge Brad De La Pena, who was just reappointed to the court by Governor Dayton, and our newest judge, Thomas Halaska, and also with us is Ms. Lisa Peister, our longtime court administrator. Our PowerPoint slides are in your packet. This is our budget presentation, but we've included two slides just to briefly remind you of who we are and what we do. The material will be covered when we last appeared before you. Again, we're an independent trial court within the executive branch established by the legislature to hear only tax-related cases. But within that limited jurisdiction, Again, we hear cases involving any property located anywhere in the state and any tax administered by the Department of Revenue. We have three budget requests for your consideration. First, we're asking for an increase in our base budget to allow us to continue to provide mandated services to taxpayers, the Commissioner of Revenue, and the counties. We're also asking for a one-time uh, expenditure to allow us to replace our aging case management system and Judge Haluska will discuss that request in more detail. And finally we're asking for funds to hire a third judicial law clerk and Judge De La Pena will discuss that request briefly at the end. We've given you two views of our existing budget. The vast majority of appropriated funds are dedicated to the payment of rent and salaries, none of which is under our control. Judges' salaries are set by statute at 98.52% of the salary of the district court judge. The salaries of our three administrative staff members are negotiated by their respective unions and bargaining units. The salaries of our two law clerks are determined by management and budget based on their job classification and our rent is established by the Department of Administration. Viewed another way, 90, about 95% of our current budget is fixed costs. Take out those fixed costs and we have about $50,000 left to cover everything else we have to do. For example, we are required by statute to provide transcripts for indigent taxpayers. We are required by statute to provide interpreters for taxpayers who could not otherwise participate meaningfully in the proceedings. Because the taxpayer has the right to have the case heard in the county in which the property is located, 
We travel to all 87 counties in the state, wherever the taxpayer wants the case heard. In addition, we have to pay for postage, long distance calls, returning calls to taxpayers in the counties, paper for the copier, office supplies, IT support and keeping our library and reference materials current. I'll cover the first of our three budget requests. We're requesting an increase in the base budget to be able to continue our core operations and to continue to provide those mandatory services. This request is necessitated by several things. First, we've historically used an outside technology consultant for our IT related work. Everything from installing and configuring new computers to fixing our email when it crashes. A few years ago, you, the legislature, required consolidation of all executive branch IT related functions within a single agency known as MINIF, MN.IT. For us, that transition will occur in the next biennium, and as a result, our IT costs are going to increase on an ongoing basis. In addition, we will have two one-time projects in the next biennium as part of that transition. First, we've got to replace our existing phone system with one that will accommodate VoIP, voice over the internet protocol. And second, Minute will take over posting of our website. And those one-time projects will involve one-time expenditures of about 52,000 in the next fiscal year. Just an aside about the conversion of our website. That is an important resource. Our decisions are not published by Westlaw in the bound volumes you see in law libraries and on TV. The only place our decisions are available for free is on our website. Yes, they're available through Westlaw and Lexis, but those are paid subscriptions. So for self-represented litigants, for pro, pro se taxpayers who want to bolster their arguments, who want to see what we have done in the past, the only place they can find that information is on our website. Our existing website is probably about 15 years old. It's static. We can't post notices and announcements on it. It has a search engine, but the search engine is lousy. So that's what's prompted the request for funds to modernize that website to allow us to post notices and announcements, but more importantly, to improve that search engine. Because the better prepared the taxpayer is, the better the outcome, the better our decision is. Second, we're asking for an increase in our ba base budget to cover projected salary increases for the three of us judges. Again, our salaries are set by statute at 98.52% of the salary of a district court judge. As you know, the judicial branch is asking for a 5% increase for its judges. Uh, and if that goes through or whatever the increase, that will filter down to us. In addition, one of our staff members will reach normal retirement age in the coming biennium and will be entitled to a payout of accumulated vacation leave, a portion of accumulated sick leave. Uh, she's been with the court for 15 years. We cannot absorb these increases within our existing budget and still provide our core services to taxpayers. And third, we, as I mentioned, we're asking, uh, there are expenses which by statute we're required to incur, transcripts for indigent taxpayers, interpreters. In addition, we've got travel costs uh, to all 87 counties in the past two years and the two years that we've been with the court. I personally have been to Otter Tail County, Crow Wing County, Olmstead, Winona, Chief Judge Della Pena, spent a good amount of time in Itasca County. Now that the court is fully staffed, we no longer have the judicial salary savings we've used to pay those costs for the past couple of years. <coughs> All of that uh, totals about 150,000 in fiscal 16 and about 130,000 in fiscal 17. And to put those requests in some perspective, the total salaries paid to our three administrative <coughs> staff this year is about 159,000. Without the requested increase, we would have to lay off our entire administrative staff in order to cover those mandatory expenditures. Second, we're asking for funds to replace our case management system. Judge Holaska will discuss that request. 
Good morning. Uh, our primary infrastructure in the tax court is our case management system. It is uh, circa 1999. In other words, it's about 15 years old. It's not supported by the vendor. Minute won't support it. And it won't operate on a current Windows uh, operating system. Essentially, or what it does operate on is Windows XP, which is an obsolete, unsupported, and unsecured uh, version of Windows. We have it currently jury rigged in order to operate on uh, our network. Uh, it, if it takes a dive, we're basically we're done because the case management system is what tells us what we've got and where it is that we've got it. I mean, without that, we don't know the cases that we have in our system. At the time that we got the original case management system, we were averaging about 1,200 cases a year. Since then, we've been as high as uh, 5,800 cases. Uh, currently, we're at 3,483 in 2014. Now, the system itself does not communicate with the district court. And what, pro what, it, what it is is property cases, which is most of our caseload, are filed with the district courts uh, in various counties. What they are done is they're entered into MNSIS at that time. So they're actually there electronically. They sit with uh, the judicial system and electronic version. And, but what we do is once they're filed, they're actually then, they're entered into the MNSIS system and then they're handwritten and sent to us in writing, a brief summary of each of those cases which we then have to enter by hand. And we don't necessarily receive notice of all these cases. So our case management system is incapable of talking to the courts. Once it comes to us as paper, we have to re-enter it. And subsequent filings come to us as paper. So in other words, in our electronic age, we're still using paper almost entirely to track all of our cases. And this is going to create a problem because, I mean, it's a problem now in the sense that uh, it really slows our efficiency. But the district courts are going to e-filing. In other words, what the judiciary is requiring is that everybody file electronically. Our system isn't going to be able to handle that. Other problems that exist with our system is that there are limited reports. So we have trouble following what it is that we've done, being able to track it, and being able to follow it, and then estimate what it is that we've got and are going to need in the future. All routine documents must be uh, created by hand. So in other words, our scheduling orders where what we'll do is we'll put out a kind of a routine scheduling order. Current case management systems would be able to do that on an automatic basis. We can't do that. Everything has to be done by hand. So a new system would be an overall increase in our efficiency. Now we've got a cost estimate of $1.4 million in one-time funds over the next biennium. This is a minute estimate. We have ongoing annual charges, again, minute estimates of $144,000 a year. This would be $84,000 as the current minute charge for hosting and minute support, with the balance would be possible ongoing fees by, charged by the vendor, such as licensing or other support that the vendor would be able to would be required to give that Minute can't do. Now we've hired a consultant to help us review existing case management systems and to prepare a selection criteria so that if our request is granted, we can move forward quickly. Just to follow up on Judge Haluska's remarks, as Judge Haluska indicated, we are now notified on paper that a case has been filed. 
if we don't get that notice for some reason, we don't have any way to know the case exists. In the two years that we have, the three of us have been with the court, we've learned of more than 150 of those <coughs> cases. 150 cases that were settled or dismissed, that's how we found out they existed. We were notified that the case had been settled or dismissed, but we didn't know that they existed in the first place. That's a problem for the counties because under our property tax system, once you petition taxes in a pay year, you only have to make your first half payment. You don't have to make your second half payment for as long as that case is outstanding. So that's 150 cases in the last two years that languished because we didn't know they existed. We couldn't issue a scheduling order. We couldn't move those cases forward. Our third request is a relatively modest amount to add a third judicial law clerk, and Judge Della Pena will address that request. Good morning. Judge, go ahead with your name and title. Brad Della Pena, the judge of the Minnesota Tax <coughs> Court. <coughs> law clerks are the staffers of the judicial function. The tax court was designed to be and functions as a check upon the power of state taxing authorities. The court is independent of both the governor and the taxing authorities. Once appointed, judges are not subject to removal by the governor. And we review final agency action rather than making recommendations to the taxing authorities. Thousands of taxpayers each year file tax court cases to obtain a neutral evaluation of whether state taxing agencies have properly implemented legislatively determined tax policy. The court's independence allows it to serve as an effective check on the power exercised by state taxing authorities. That independence also makes proper staffing critical. Courts apply law to fact. Law clerks allow judges to command the facts of each individual case by examining the evidence presented in court. They also allow the court to locate and analyze all legal authority pertinent to the set of facts provided in each individual case. We currently have two law clerks for the three of us. We're asking for a third law clerk. Uh, our request is for $85,000 per year for fiscal years 16 and 17. Okay, go ahead. The last slide in your packet. Oh, ma'am? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry, I've got a, a question from uh, Representative Johnson. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm not sure who would, who would uh, prefer to answer this question. Dealing with the case management system, we have a case management system for the, that covers all 87 counties that everybody can look at. I'm just wondering if there's a reason that you cannot use that system as well so you get your information. You can also judge or schedule your things when the courts are, courtrooms are free in those other counties and, and to make things more smoothly and runs more smoothly instead of, again, if a system having to notify you and move everything to a different case management system for these cases, if you could not use the current system, making it more efficient for you, for everybody, and also saving the taxpayers money of over a, over a few years, it wouldn't be long before it would be a couple million dollars. Judge? Uh, Chairman Cornish, Representative Johnson, uh, that was our first thought. The, the biggest difficulty with doing so is the Data Practices Act, to which we, as part of the executive branch, arguably are subject, but to which the judicial branch is not. So um, we have had discussions with the judicial branch about essentially becoming the 88th county in Minnesota. Those discussions um, did not pan out for largely that reason. Obviously, that, that would have been a possible solution, but it simply is not going to be feasible. Mr. Chair. 
Representative Hilstrom. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we actually heard a number of these issues with relationship to the tax court and the judiciary um, when I was chair in the last two years. And one of the challenges is because this is part of the executive branch and not part of the judiciary, there really are, it's really a separation of um, powers issue as well. So we wanted to see if they could even share um, MNSIS subscriptions. And really, given the fact that they're in two different branches, it makes it impossible. Okay. Any other questions? Are you, uh, any more in your presentation? Just to finish up, Chairman Cornish. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so the last slide in your packet compares our budget to the filing fees generated uh, by the cases filed in our court. Filing fees in our cases are the same as in district court, about $310. Depending on the county, $150 for a small claims case. The court's budget remained flat until the current biennium when our budget was increased to allow us to access Westlaw and to hire the two judicial law clerks about which uh, you've heard some. Thank you, thank you, thank you for those funds. We have put them to such good use. Our clerks are terrific. Our output has increased. Our decisions are so much better for it. Historically, the court's budget has been far less than the fees that it generated, although the number of cases filed in our court has decreased recently, they still cover a substantial part of our budget, and we expect they will continue to do so in the future. That concludes our formal presentation, Mr. Chairman. We'd be happy to answer any other questions. Okay, members, anybody have any questions? I don't. Okay, well, thank you very much for your presentation. Appreciate thank it. You. Next, we have uh, Judicial Standards Board presentation. Um, Tom, the last name. Vasily, Mr. Chair. There we go. Good morning. Tom Vasily, the Executive Secretary of the Judicial Standards Board. Uh, go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, uh, our board is asking for a small bump in its annual appropriation, $30,000, uh, in order to hire a half-time attorney investigator. And we think this is a proposal that's going to result in actually uh, saving money for the state uh, over the long run. Uh, our budget is $456,000 a year. Um, only $331,000 of that amount is to operate the board, primarily uh, saving the salary of two people and rent. Uh, whenever we litigate a case, whenever we propose a judge, uh, propose uh, a, that a judge be disciplined, if the judge contests, we have to go to the private sector to hire an attorney for the investigation and for the prosecution. And that's extremely expensive. Uh, even though our base budget is 331, we have $125,000 a year appropriation for major cases such as this. Even that's not sufficient. Over the years, uh, this board has repeatedly gone to the legislature asking for special appropriations for uh, funding litigation. It's averaging about $80,000 a year. If you look at the uh, governor's budget proposal, you can see in past years that even though our base budget is 456,000, uh, well, several years ago we asked for an additional $300,000 for several litigation cases, and a couple of years before that we asked for an additional $290,000 a year. Our goal is to not have to do that anymore. Our, we, it's not gonna be totally within our control uh, whether a case is contested or not, but the things that we do can have an impact and one practical thing we can do is investigate the cases in-house to the extent possible. Rather than hiring a law firm for $250, $300 an hour to do the investigation, we can have a part-time attorney do the initial investigation at a cost of about one-fifth that uh, in terms of salary and fringe. So uh, we think that not only doing the investigations in-house is going to be a lot cheaper than doing the investigations by a private law firm or a private detective agency or other outside vendor. In addition, we think that the time we spend 
working up the case in-house is going to make it less likely that judges are going to contest because we can show the judge exactly what facts we have, uh, give the jo judge an opportunity to tell us if we've got any facts wrong, and uh, if not, then we can resolve the case without litigation. So it, I can't guarantee this, but our goal is never to have to ask for a special appropriation again. And so instead of having uh, a budget averaging roughly um, what, 550 a year perhaps with the special appropriations, it'll be $486,000 a year, which represents a $30,000 increase from our current budget. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions, members? You must have done a good job. Well, thank you. <laughs> and let's Silence can be consent sometimes. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Now, our last one. Now we have our last presentation. Uh, Greg Cook, the executive director of the Private Detective Board. Come ahead, sir, and have a seat. You can bring him up with you if you like. And State your name and title and begin. Good morning, Mr. Chair, committee members. Good morning. My name is Greg Cook, and I am the uh, executive director with the Minnesota Board of Private Detectives and Protective Agents. I have with me uh, Mr. Dan Boydham, who is my fiscal advisor from the Office of Fiscal and Administrative Services. <clears throat> I will be very brief today, <clears throat> as I've already provided the committee with information in our budget overview. I just wanted to clarify what our agency's goals are. Uh, with public safety and consumer protection as the agency's guideposts, our responsibility is to provide regulation and oversight to the private detective and protective agent industry. This includes ensuring investigative and security service license holders meet and maintain statutory qualifications and act responsibly <coughs> and for the best interest of their clients. We also provide assistance to applicants and current license holders in order to help them achieve success in what is a difficult field. Our key services include processing applications, officer changes and renewals, investigating complaints, certifying training instructors and courses, assisting law enforcement in the investigation of unlicensed activity, and responding to inquiries. Additional tasks include providing support to other government agencies, preparing for and facilitating board meetings, conducting requested research and, re research and reports for the board and other government agencies, representing the board at court hearings and events, working on legislative proposals, managing the databases, and administrative tasks. My job as the executive director is to provide the board with information so they can make decisions. Our current agency is appropriated $120,000 annually. All funds received go to the general fund. I will now turn it over to Dan, who can explain the change item. <clears throat> Within the private detective board's budget, there is a change. Could you do your from, name and title? Oh, excuse me. My name is Dan Boytum. I'm uh, with the Department of Public Safety, Office of Fiscal Administrative Services. Our office provides fiscal support to the Private Detective Board. Okay, go ahead, sir. The governor recommends an operating adjustment of $2,000 in fiscal year 16 and a $4,000 adjustment in fiscal year 17. This is to accommodate compensation related costs with regard to health insurance and bargaining unit uh, adjustments. Uh, I think that's about all I have to say about the uh, change item. Okay, members, questions? Hmm. All right. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we uh, are going to uh, adjourn and uh, anything uh, you got, folks? All right. Just would um, like you to hear my bills, Mr. Chair. Huh? We'd like, we'd like yeah. you to hear our bills, Mr. Yeah, Chair. Yeah, we should have scheduled <laughs> them today, huh? <laughs> um, we'll adjourn until when? Tomorrow. All right, meeting adjourned.